Hey guys, this is Kendall Terry, and this is looking at plants' defense and their how they defend themselves, how they respond to pathogens, how do they respond to intruders, how they respond to really predators. Uh, many people don't think about predators uh, being out there for plants, but anything that eats a plant to the plant is a predator, and the plant is a prey. So how do plants defend themselves, so to speak? Um, well, the first line of defense for a plant is the dermal tissue, that tissue that surrounds the plant. Um, we've talked about this waxy cuticle layer. Well, that's the, the molecule that makes that is actually cutin. Cutin is a macromolecule consisting of long-chain fatty acids linked together on plant parts above ground. So everything above ground on a plant will have a layer of cutin, and some will have very thick layers of cutin, others have thin layers, and some of that depends on what they have faced evolutionarily that would cause them to have either thicker or thin layers there of cutin. Below the surface, they have what we call uh, subarin, and subarin is another version of the linked fatty acid chains um, that help protect everything below the soil. The Casparian strip is involved in the subarin, and it allows certain things in and out and helps that everything go through those, uh, those, those endodermal cells that we've talked about before in plant roots. The next line of defense uh, primarily is toxins, and, and there's tons of toxins out there that we could actually talk about with plants, and we use some of those toxins um, to our benefit, and other toxins um, we've used to hinder other and, and hurt other organisms like poisons. Um, so toxins are, are fascinating things when you look at plants, and these toxins were designed evolutionarily to keep um, organisms from eating them. Uh, so if you encounter me as a plant and you eat part of me or you brush up against me and by doing that I've released some kind of toxin onto you that you remember and you go I don't want that toxin on me I'm gonna make sure that I uh, don't encounter that plant again and for those of you that are out there that are allergic to poison ivy this is what you're allergic to is actually a toxin that it secretes that oil on its surface that if you touch it, it creates those hives and bumps and itchy spots and all of that on your skin. And you remember real quick when you're allergic to poison ivy what it looks like so that you can stay away from it. I know I do. I have to be very careful around it um, because I will get it. And I, I've joked about, you know, if I breathe this stuff, I feel like I break out in it. So I'm very cautious and I know what it looks like. And why? Because it's a toxin. It's a good defense that that plant has developed. Now here are some that, that we could list tons of these, but here are some of uh, the ones that are more common to what we uh, use and encounter. Of course, cyanide, uh, that one is used more uh, for bad things, right? Like uh, trying to kill someone, that's, that's not good. Um, but you've got alkaloids, tannins. Tannins are things that we use uh, to, to, to color animal skins. Tannins have been used for years in the preservation and coloring of, of certain animal skins uh, like cowhide and stuff like that. Uh, plant oils, and we talked about this with like the poison ivy, that's a plant oil that's on the surface of the, of the plant. Allopathy, ricin, phytoestrin, taxol, quinine, some of these are being researched um, to cause major things uh, in, in development of whole cultures of people. Of, of Is there a, a a chemical here that maybe this culture is getting that's hurting them because of what they're eating? Or is there a chemical that we could possibly give that would be a supplement? A lot of, of supplements that people take have a, a toxin, plant toxin background. So toxins are amazing to research. Primarily you're looking at these are the guys that are causing problems most of the time in the predators that are trying to defeat them um, or, or hurt the plant. So this toxin helps to hurt or even kill at times that that um, individual that's trying to hurt the plant. Another um, defense is for the tree to develop a mutualistic relationship with an animal. And we see this with the sacia trees and ants. That's a fascinating relationship that you should look more in detail on. But the one that I really like is the parasitoid wasp caterpillars and leaves. And we actually have these in East Tennessee um, where, where I'm from. Uh, right now with Heritage High School, right? So uh, we've got the leaf here, and there's a caterpillar eating that leaf, you know, munching down. Well, caterpillars are, are amazing predators of leaves, and I mean, they will devour parts of plants. 
Um, I actually watched my father-in-law's yard get devoured, the grass get devoured by this infestation of caterpillars uh, this last fall. It was crazy watching this um, take place. I mean, just overnight, it looked like his yard just disappeared. and We had to uh, put some pesticides out there trying to kill these things. It was crazy. Well, in this case, the plant will secrete a chemical into the air that attracts parasitoid wasps. Well, parasitoid wasp will want to lay its eggs in in the caterpillar. And when it lays its eggs in the caterpillar, the caterpillar will no longer be able to destroy the plant like it was before. And the larva of the uh, parasitoid wasp will literally eat the inside of the caterpillar and then come out on the outside of that caterpillar and, ha and, and pupate and then hatch into these, other, these more parasitoid wasps. I had a student actually bring these in to class. Fascinating uh, relationship between the plant and the, cat uh, and, the, and the parasitoid wasp. Really cool mutualistic relationship. The last is very interesting. It's a pathogen-specific defense. So this is similar to your immune uh, system in, in humans, but it's not as complex. In us, we actually have a long-term memory that works over, over um, possibly even your, your lifetime once you encounter certain things. But in plants, it's not as, uh, as complex necessarily that we think of with, with humans. So the first thing here to look at is a gene-for-gene -gene hypothesis. And the gene-for-gene -gene hypothesis that some cells will have a gene that secretes, and we call this the R gene, and it will make an R gene product, which is more than likely a protein. That protein has a specific shape. So as the molecule, in this case it's a virus up here at the top, or you could look at bacteria or fungi, enter that plant cell, if the, the virus has the shape that fits that R gene product, then it will cause the cell to go into a hypersensitive response, and we'll look at what that is in just a second. If it doesn't, which you see here with the bacteria, it does not fit that. When it doesn't fit, then the cell doesn't know how to deal with that, and there will probably be some kind of disease that develop on the plant. Over Down here, you've got here's the fungi attacking. It's matching that R gene product, so hypersensitive response, no, gene, no disease occurs. Let's see what the hypersensitive response is. So in the hypersensitive response, you see it right here on the left side of the screen, the hypersensitive response, whenever a cell encounters that R gene product that says, yes, this matches, it will actually go into what we call programmed cell death, and it will give a local cell death to several of the cells that are even around it. It says, hey, you might be infected, and it starts just killing off these random cells in the plant. It will also, that's the hypersensitive response, kill the cell. It will also send out a signal molecule. That signal molecule will go and cause a systemic acquired resistance. Systemic being a certain area from the infected cell will now be hypersensitive, if you will, to that pathogen. It will say, hey, there's a, there's something, there may be a pathogen here that you need to watch out for. This is what it looks like. And it will cause that R gene product to be developed in these cells to be a temporary kind of broad range resistance to the pathogen to say, look out for this guy. And if he comes around, it will go into that hypersensitive response as well, and you'll get more of those systemic acquired resistance uh, responses going on as well. So it helps the plant to kind of localize or seal off the area that's infected. If it's infected out here in the branch, it seals that branch off, and then uh, that, that way the disease doesn't spread to the whole plant. Uh, so it's kind of like kill a limb, save the plant, as opposed to if you don't kill the limb, then in, at the end of the day the whole plant dies.